Hi, I'm Jamie Tomey, and I am so excited about today's Evanston Bound Foreign Tour with Amy Jacobs of Du Denae in New York City. Thank you for joining us. I hope you have a good time watching. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here for this week's Quarant Tour. We have such a great group in our room today. We have a lot of friends hanging out to see Amy Jacobs. And I would love to welcome you. Amy, hello. How are you? Hi, Amy. I'm great. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So tell us where you're coming from in this particular time. Because it's, right it's interesting. Yeah, where are you right now? I'm in Ridgewood, Queens, right near... Um, Brooklyn, Bushwick in New York City. Um, and I actually started back on Tuesday for the first time since at, March at 12th. Started back to work at Dudenay. So oh and I bought gosh. a car yesterday. You did buy a car yesterday. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. Um, one of the I'm things that yeah, one of the things I was going to say to our people here was that our conversation the other day was that you were a little bit nervous with New York. Um, transit and being so close with everyone so you felt like you needed to buy a car to get to work I know. so it's tell really us, scary yeah. it's really scary right now and you, and New York Manhattan everywhere is sort of slowly opening up but you just now went back to do can you tell us a little bit about how you came to the book arts came to your position at do and actually you're, the name of your position is not co-director of awesomeness, although I think it should be because that's what you do. Can you tell us about your job there? That's a lot. So go ahead and just start talking, Amy. What, what do you do at Dudenay and how did you get there? Sure. So, um, well, I met you at Columbia College Chicago. So yes. before I went to grad school, when I was in undergrad, I thought that I was going to go to graduate school for art therapy. And oh. I had to take art prerequisites. So I took, you know, drawing, painting, and I took a textile class. And we made a little bit of paper in that class. And my mentor at the time encouraged me to apply to a craft school to kind of play around and experiment with different mediums. So I went to Penland School of Crafts near oh. Asheville, North Carolina, mm -hmm. and I got a scholarship to take a two month weaving class. And then while there, um, I applied for a core fellowship. So I had a fellowship there for two years and I studied um, paper arts there with Mary Hark was my first teacher. And so I took a number of book and paper classes there. Um, and I met Marilyn Swart, oh. who helped start the book and paper program. So I met her there and Mina Takahashi and mm -hmm. Sue Gosen. So, yeah. and I met Audrey Nippenmaker, who, so I went there. Um, and why I was there, Marilyn introduced me to Sue Gosen. So between, you know, it's a three-year program. So between each um, semester or each year, I would intern or assist. So I worked under a number of paper makers in different schools. And when I met Sue, she said, you know, ah, maybe you'll come and work at Dudene at some point. So <laughs> after graduate school, I to open a paper making studio and out of the blue one day on my birthday, I think Sue called and asked if I would move to New York City and work at Dudenay. So I did. That's so happy Mountain birthday. <laughs> yeah, it was great. And I've been here in New York for about 10 years. Um, my position at Dudenay, I started off as like a studio manager, studio collaborator, and now I am the co-director of artistic projects and master collaborator. It's ridiculous. Oh, I love that story. I love how you had this other plan for your life and you ended up meeting these people who meant so much to your development as an artist and as a paper maker that you just sort of ended up in this wonderful role where you get to help other artists make their work. So exactly. do you want to start sharing your screen and maybe we can talk about that? Or is there anything else you want to add to that history of your world? <laughs> oh, first, no, yeah, what, yeah. Do the name is. what is do the name? Yeah. Some people so, don't know. Um, yes, so do the name, and the, the name is French. It means God given, which our founder, Sue Gosen's father's nickname 
was do a donate. So oh. that's why we did the name. Um, we're a nonprofit organization based in New York City that started in 1976. And um, when Sue started Dudenay, they were really making production paper using a lot of rags from the garment district here. So some custom paper, but they would sell paper. And then, and I'll talk about this in the presentation, but they ended up um, working with Chuck Close as one of the first like collaborative projects been our main focus yeah that's really what we do and i can talk about the residency programs and all that um dude like i said dude was founded in 1976 by sue gosen who is right there pulling some sheets in the studio um a few years later paul wong came he had gone to graduate school with her at the university of wisconsin and he came about three years later and he was our artistic director for 37 or 38 years, a very long time. So he developed a lot of the techniques over the years that Dudenay uses. Um, so yeah, so Paul was at Dudenay for about 37 years. He retired a couple years ago. So I was lucky to be able to work with him for um, nine years or so, eight years, um, side by side, which was amazing. And I, I learned a lot from him. And just um, side note, I, end, I was assisting him at Penland one year during graduate school, which is how I also ended up at Dudenay. So I always encourage people that are in school to kind of go out there when they can and do internships or assistantships, anything like that just to learn from more artists and paper makers and book binders and all of that. Yeah, more experience so, um, for sure. Ex exactly. And um, Chuck Close was one of the first artists that Dudenay worked with collaboratively here with Joe Wilford. They were, um, Pace, uh, Pace Prince asked them to work on this project. So that's kind of how all of this started. He came, I think this was like 19... And he came back in the 90s to do another self-portrait. Yeah. So here's... So like can we go... Basic. Yeah, can we sure. go back to the actually that first one? Because I think you have the first one with Chuck and, and um, Joe. Joe. Um, so so I'm, I'm totally interrupting because technique. But is this a... Um, this is a sheet of pulp, white pulp. Mm -hmm. And then it is the 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 grid that is like the window grid or the lighting grid, right? That plastic white grid. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming they're putting overbeaten pulp into those little spots to do the self-portrait, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So there were three bottles with like twelve different shades or maybe twenty, I can't remember now, different shades of gray. So he made a number of these portraits. Um some are similar to paintings he did around the same time. A Philip Glass, um, there's yeah. a couple. Okay, so he came back in the early 80s and here they're using kind of a metal shim stencil and then also mylar stencils over that to create, I don't remember how many different stencils they had for this, a number of them, but I know there are about 20 or 30 different shades of gray for this one too. Yeah, so yeah. We are constantly um, working with artists. So we're making large amounts of pulp all of the time. So these are our two 10 pound beaters. They can hold 10 pounds of dry fiber. And we also have two small Hollander beaters that we make test pulps with or pulp paint or something like that. And here's a little video. So this is my coworker, Tatiana Ginsberg. And we're pulling um, a sheet of paper using a, a decal box. So here we poured the pulp in. We're kind of mixing it up with the water. And this is a 40 by 60 inch molding decal. So it takes two people to do. Oh my gosh. And then we're pulling the sheet out. And we run over and give it a shake to try to even it out. It's really heavy. What kind of pulp is this? Um, 
Do you remember? It drained pretty fast. Yeah. I think this was paper we were making for Joan Jones, the artist. I'm not sure. All right. So then we like take our tweezers and pick out all of the crud that you see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's um, that's the that's when you get to do the obsession part. <laughs> yeah. I always say that. I mean, my favorite tools are tweezers and eyedroppers, as well as the molds and decals. Sure. Cap, but sure. Here's Tatiana and Paul. They're getting ready to remove the deco box, the top part. And, you know, you can make any size paper. You don't have to make rectangular sheets. We, with the larger molds and the deco box, we kind of remove the pulp by hand using the straight edge. Um, we just oh, measure cool. it. So they're making Is that to make a square sheet, a large square sheet, it looks like? Yep. That's so yep. cool. I should mention, this is our studio at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So in 2016, we moved to the Navy Yard from Manhattan. So it's been great to be in Brooklyn and we're right by the water and we have a great view of the city and there's also a farm on our roof. So oh, <laughs> just a little okay. I love that. Do you have a paper maker's garden up there? No, to them about eventually doing something like that and working with kids, but they, they're a big supplier to restaurants and they have, um, we've worked with a couple of their kids camps, but we haven't actually started to grow a garden yet. Grow a garden yet. Okay. So now what's this, what's happening here? So Tatiana and Akemi are getting ready to couch, uh, coucher, which is French for to lay. They're getting ready to transfer that sheet of pulp. Uh, onto a post which you can see there's um, a felt and then we use Pellon or interfacing which I think a lot of paper makers do now. Yeah. So here they're pooching that. And just to just to reiterate the vocabulary a post is when you have multiple layers of Pellon and sheets of pulp so that you can press more than one sheet of paper at a time, right? Exactly. You, you yes. Got <laughs> you this is a job every day, so I throw around the lingo, sometimes forgetting that, you know, I should explain. Have, yeah, no, it's fine. Oh, and look at that press. Holy cannoli. So this is the crusher. This is our um, hydraulic <laughs> press that can press these 40 by 60 inch sheets. And then we also have a smaller press, the hydraulic press that you can see uh, behind her. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. So, so we, um, we use a lot of pulp paint at Duodenay for all different um, techniques, pulp painting and using through stencils and silk screen and paintbrush and all of that. And at Duodenay, we use a linen fabric that's been cut into small squares and we cook it in some soda ash to help break it down and then we beat it for about 13 hours. Wow. So it just creates this really beautiful, lush, smooth, creamy consistency that depending on um, what you're doing with it, we will change that consistency around. So here an artist is pouring it so it's really kind of liquidy and flowy. I don't know any other way to describe it, yeah. but well, I think those are the technical terms, liquidy exactly. and flowy. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, um, you know, sometimes we'll add more methyl cellulose or formation aid or something like that to help um, if people are painting with a paintbrush or I've got, to, I've got um, slides of that. So we do make paper. Um, we've started to kind of slow down our custom paper making right now. You'll see our studio is constantly it looks like this and there's a lot of it's just it's hard to then turn around break down a studio and make perfect white sheets of paper so we right, really like right. focusing working with artists so we will have um, studio rentals we have group rentals we have a small community studio um, but our main big programs are these um, the lab grant residency program and a workspace residency program so i'll talk about both of those so our lab grant residency program is for a mid-career established artist that we have an art and gallery committee that decides, um, we kind of brainstorm and we think about artists that we think 
would be a good fit and would be open to experimentation and working collaboratively. And then we invite those artists. So there's not an application process for this. Um, so we have, you know, we try to build it out every two years, but it's, we have artists that are based in New York, but we've also have art, like artists that are not living in New York. So although we say we work with them for a year or more, sometimes it goes on a lot longer than a year. Oh, wow. That is so yeah. cool. Yeah. So this is Nicole Eisenman, who was our um, 2018 Lab Grant resident. And she's a painter here in New York. Um, she's a MacArthur Genius um, Fellow. And she just had a big um, show with all of the work that she made at Dudenay in April, right before no, March is when it ended, right before we all went into lockdown, so I saw it. But here, she's working in our studio um, on these really large pulp paintings. Mm -hmm. And the Lab Grant residents come, uh, they work with us over the course of a year for 13 days. So each art paired with the collaborator, which was um, Paul when he was here, myself or Tatiana Ginsberg, who's the other um, collaborator right now. And we will kind of work with them throughout their residency. So 95% of the artists that come have never worked in paper. Oh, wow. So there's a lot of like conversation going back and forth and introducing them to the medium. Um, and kind of we're there to help guide them with the techniques and all of the different materials and all of that. So in the discussions, we kind of come up with a plan after there are a lot of, you know, maybe two or three days in the studio just playing around. We develop a plan and we have everything prepared when that artist comes in. So Oh, that's all so the, great. Yeah, they're all pigmented. All the boards and the, everything is that everything is completely set up so that when they walk in, we just get started right away. So they so make a lot. Yeah. So I'm I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm just trying to I'm trying to wrap my head around the fact that you have a certain number, certain amount of time with them, but you have so you have to sort of teach them some of the things that paper can do while also supporting their vision of what they want to do with the, with the materials. That's so creative and fascinating to me and how, how it works. So, ah, yay. Yeah, so it's a really unique job. I mean, it's fun and it's challenging, um, which I love. I have never been bored, like, not one day have I been bored. Um, and people come up with these amazing ideas that, I'm still surprised there are things that we can do in paper that, you know, I've never thought of. They just think of these wacky things. And usually we say, well, let's try it as long as it doesn't hurt the equipment. I'm up for yeah. trying anything. So yeah, yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then that becomes something that you can have in your toolbox to say, yeah. hey, this is a thing that this artist came up with. You want to try it for yours if it works or if we want to adapt. That's so fascinating to exactly. me. Exactly. And we do have on-site archives with uh, over 40 years worth of um, artwork that we will pull out different techniques to show people what that kind of, that finished product looks like, just so they can see. Because otherwise it's yeah. difficult to imagine. Yeah. And especially if they haven't worked with paper at all, they don't know the opportunities and the innovation that, that can come up when they're talking with you as a collaborator. Exactly. I love it. All right, yeah. so what's happening here with this beautiful blue? Yeah, awesome. so Nicole's a painter and she was really drawn to painting with the pulp and she loved kind of working with the squeeze bottles and the freedom and the spontaneity and she worked very organically and intuitively drawing with these um, squeeze bottles with the linen pulp. So they are cotton-based sheets with linen uh, pulp paint on top. Mm. And she was also drawing with um, rope. So oh. we the rope down and then she would pulp paint, kind of use that as an outline, pulp paint. And then we would give it a little press and then pull out the rope so that you could still see the embossment. Yeah, oh my gosh. Wow. And 
she made a number of what she called posters um, that were kind of looking at old movie posters um, yeah. for reference. And she made about 80 pieces during her residency. Wow. And they're big pieces. That's big. crazy. Yeah. That's a really lot cool. Of, yeah. A lot are 40 by 60 inches. Some are 30 by 40 inches. And then she also made some small ones as well. So these are all one of a kind paintings. Mm -hmm. Do you, you're probably going to get this in your later slideshow, but do you do, uh, do artists come in to do additions at all where they're making the same pieces, multiple copies of the same piece? Yes. So, okay. yeah, I'll so about yeah, I'll let you get to that later. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. No, 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 it's good. Ask away. So this is Natalie Frank. So our other workspace, our other residency program we have is called a workspace residency. And this um, residency is for New York State based artists, unfortunately. I wish it was open to everyone, but our funders come from New York State. So it is an application application process right yeah for self-defined emerging artist and last year we've had we've had over the years up to 400 people apply for four spots each year oh, wow so it's a really fun residency they're um, paired with a collaborator for five days over the course of a year so you know we meet they learn about the medium we experiment we meet again, look at the dry work, prep materials, I prep materials, they come back, they come in, we make work, and then we kind of do that over many months. So Yeah, fantastic. And she is working here with pulp paint, again, like Nicole, but in a different way. So she's using, she's a paint, well, she actually uses a lot of oil pastels, but here she's painting with the pulp. So all painting and pouring, um, because you want layers to dry, as she, or not dry, but drain as she's painting, we, I set up like a lot of stations so that she can work on multiple ones at the same time and allow time for, you know, a layer to drain a little before she goes back over it. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So she would move from one spot to the next, do a layer, move to the next one, do a layer, move to the next one, and then go back to the first one and do the next layer on that. That's exactly. so great. How long did it take for that linen to drain? Uh, on, and this is cotton base for this, the base this sheet? Is, this is probably a mixture of cotton and Advica sheets. Um, she picks out the fibers and the colors, and I made all of this beforehand, and then she kind of tells me what color and what size she wants and I just sure. pulled those and for Natalie she really picked up how to paint with pulps on her own um she, they're kind of amazing let yeah show, let me show you the details so oh my gosh yes wow and the detail that's and with a paintbrush that's with the paintbrush she pours sometimes so for paper makers out there there's a lot of formation aid in this pulp paint and for everyone else, Formation Aid does what oh, for these, it, for this pulp? Yeah. Tell you, yeah, I'm going to let you walk through. Okay. <laughs> it, it's typically used in Eastern paper making, and it helps to form sheets um, using Kozo or Gompi, mulberry fibers. Longer so, fibers so that, yeah. the, that you can layer the fibers, and it's exactly. a little bit. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, it just helps you form that sheet. It gives you some time because it slows down the drainage of the pulp. So it's doing the same thing here. So when you mix it with this linen pulp paint, if you, you know, squirt it out of a squeeze bottle onto that base sheet, it's going to sit there for a while. That's yeah. it and it can take a while. So when she's making these pieces, I won't press them at the end of the day. I will wait till the next day. And sometimes, to be honest, like the day after that, they're too squishy. I have to like- Still too squishy. Yeah. So did she, did she use the, the squeeze bottles and then use the, the paintbrush to manipulate the pulp? She's actually, I'm gonna go back. So all of those containers near the press behind her are the pulp paints with ladles. She <gasps> out and mixes colors from those colors that I gave her into containers that she then is pretty much using just a paintbrush or pouring. Oh, I love it. Okay, so hold on just a second. Don has a question. 
sure. about your bright colors that you're using. What are you dyeing the pulp? Are you what's happening? How do you get those bright, bright, bright colors? Sure. So a question from Don. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Don. Um, it's we use raw pigments. Some are like actual raw pigments from this place called Guerra here in New York City. Um, we'll also use raw pigments that were mixed with water that are aqueous dispersed from Carriage House, a paper making supply place, or from, from Guerra again. And um, so one reason we were using Abaca for some of these base sheets was because she wanted that brilliant saturated color that mm -hmm. you can't get from cotton. Right, because so, of the absorption of the fibers, of the pigment into the fiber, it, it's not the same kind of absorption, right? So that's, okay. yeah, so we don't really use dyes. Um, we try to use pigments. I know artists have in the past used dyed, but this is really light fast. We have artists give Pantone numbers, and then we match okay. that. And then you match to the Pantone. Okay, yeah. that's fantastic. Okay, and so, so yeah. I'm, there now, we are. I say we use the linen because it accepts the color better than cotton or abaca for the pulp painting. So you can wow. See. And the linen comes, it's raw linen. It's not, is it a creamy color base or is it white? Um, it's not a real bright white. It's a, um, I don't, it's like, I forgot what it's called. It's but like it, the moon. <laughs> yeah, it's not a super, super bright white, but we, um, we got it donated from Eileen Fisher for years. We, we were trying to use that. Recently, they're donating someplace else, so we've had to order both of it. Um, but I liked when we were using theirs. So. Elise was a workspace resident years ago, and uh, 2018, she was our paper variables artist. So each year, we invite artists. Some of them have been past residents, or some we um, invite without knowing them at all to see if they'll come and make an addition for us. And the great thing, we do make additions where everything is exactly the same, but we really love introducing an artist or having them come in and work with us on the addition and just kind of play around as we're going so that each one is, has a little bit of a variable. I think this was an addition of 36 and each one was different. Kendall is working next to her, so we have an internship program as well. If anybody wants to come intern, um, Elise is using, let me go back, she's using Mylar stencils. So we do use a lot of Mylar stencils. Um, For the work, yeah, oh, that's beautiful. Oh, how big are, um, how, I couldn't quite tell with the, no. with the first one. How big are these? They're squares. They yeah, turned out. I feel like 14. 15 by 14 or 15 by 15, I think. Mm. Quite remember. There you go. So they're in all- And is Elise, places. like, is she a printmaker by trade? He's a painter and printmaker. And okay. her paintings look a lot like this. Um, but she does very, very large paintings. But she definitely um, has worked with other printmakers as well, or she prints. Um, oh. This is Ursula Writings Farm. She's a sculptor and she makes these very, very large cedar or brass sculptures. When she was invited to the Lab Grant Residency Program, she, um, and she'll say this, she was so worried that she was going to be the first artist to like fail and not be able <laughs> to work on paper. And she ended up making like 70 pieces during her residency and now she comes back every year, a couple times a year, she's really, um, really began working with paper making as just another medium in her work. And we found that with a lot of artists, they continue working in paper and with us. Uh, it's very se seductive material. Wow, look at this. Yeah, it's a really thin linen base sheet uh, made out of the linen pulp that has long as the pulp paint. And then she takes apart different um, articles of clothing or textiles, dips them in like a black pigment, and they're laid on. And um, let me go through this so you can see. So everything is laid on that base sheet. And then a squeeze bottle full of that linen pulp that's the same pulp from the base sheet is put on top to kind of hold things down. Oh. So here, a, I think this was a scarf was put onto that base sheet and Tatiana has a, a hose with a fine mister on it that she's kind of pushing some of that black 
pigment around. And creating a little paper maker's tears sort of in it. Exactly. A little bit. Well, this will be put into the press and pressed pretty quickly instead of slow mm -hmm. so that it lets the pigment kind of release into that base sheet. And then we release the press and pull it out to see what it looks like. So it's controlled, but also a little bit up to chance, which way. Yeah, which is wonderful. Yeah. And does, does she take the fabric off? Nope. Or is the fabric still in the embedded in the piece? It's still embedded in the piece, and the white little squiggly lines that you see, that's pulp that was squeezed on top to help hold the fabric down. When it dries, it's very translucent. Um, we'll also go back, go back over it with methyl cellulose if we need yeah, to. to keep keep things in check. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's very messy. Um, lots of black pigment, graphite mixed in sometimes to the pigment. And I can see the gloves back in the back. She's wearing gloves. Oh, yeah. not seeing her hands. Definitely. This is Sarika, who is our studio manager right now, an assistant. She's putting methyl cellulose on some of the work that, um, if it's not kind of adhering or if there's no openings or not an open weave. Um, yeah. To down. Just to help hold things down. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, this is Ursula's drawing studio above her sculpture shop. And you can see in the back some of the paper pieces that she made. And she also started to um, cover some of her cedar small sculptures with abaca fiber. Oh. So this is kind of a different direction um, using that abaca, which is from the family of the banana tree. If you beat it for a long time, it's very high shrinkage and can be very translucent. Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful to use for what we call laminate casting, which is covering an armature, letting it dry, and then either removing that armature or keeping it um, in. And here we've removed the cedar pieces so that you just have this like shell of the abaca. So it's hollow and wow. it's and are those sewn together or are they just glued together? They're glued. Is it, yeah. They're glued. Oh my gosh. The, you know, this is my, my kind of stuff. Yeah. You know. You know. I'm like, That's why I wondered if you were familiar with her work. But. Yeah. I, 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 I was not and now I'm going to be going into that rabbit hole. You should. For, there's for new, decades. There's a new movie about her workout right now. Um, okay. I, I will. I'll take a look for it. And this is another artist. Oh my goodness. So this is Mel Edwards. He was our first lab grant resident. He's also a sculptor and he um, creates pieces using old tools and equipment. Um, his, I think most of his sculptures are, or installations are brass. Here he comes into the studio. He's been coming back to the studio since 2001. Um, every few years he'll come in for three or four days. We'll make a number of pieces. Um, he brings tools with him, but he also goes back into our supply room and like grabs all kinds of stuff that we will put on top of a freshly pulled sheet of paper to do a blowout, which is uh, another technique that we use a lot and one of my favorites. So here he's put down the okay. tools and different uh, pieces of foam that he cut into different shapes on top of that black sheet of paper on the mold if you can see that oh i thought that was a table no so it's wow it's, then there's a um a mosquito netting that's laid on top of that pulp before you lay those actual objects so um here yeah. is i'll show you the, the technique in a minute but this is after the blowout has occurred and removing that mosquito netting so that you just have the shape of those objects. Mosquito netting is used for him because he's using actual objects that would stick to the pulp if you just laid them down. Right, right. So um, a lot of times you can blow out shapes as well. It a, creates a silhouette and you're using a hose nozzle, a mister, to blow out everything that's not under that stencil. See, there's an action shot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's, so you're, yeah. Th you, and you can see how it's, so this is on a gray piece, right? And so if you look right below Amy's mister, you can see how it's starting to turn that creamy color. 
where right. the gray pulp is being blown out or watered out, essentially. Yes. Um, These are like plastic. This is, um, we're working with an artist who was using plastic that she collected off the beach. And we're holding it down because it would float with, with those little rocks. So if anyone saw that, that's why they're there. They're just holding down the plastic so it doesn't float away. This is an addition that we were using instead of the actual objects, a mylar shape that mimicked kind of what he does when he uses the tools. Tatiana's sheet is short cotton, which we use for blowouts, which I can talk about. And Paul in the background is cooching the base sheets of Abaca. So okay. they've got a little production going. Yeah. She put the mylar stencil down and she's removing the pulp from the mold that we don't, you know, you don't want to take that time to kind of blow away all of that. It's just faster and easier. And we use a fogget nozzle. It's a gardening nozzle that it's got, it's got a very fine mist and different levels of pressure. She's removing the mylar um, with an eyedropper. It's helpful to release the pulp from the mylar. And sometimes and the eyedropper just has water in it. Just water. Sometimes this is the hardest part. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. So we were going to mention why the, the short cotton. Oh, that's right. So short cotton is the easiest to blow away. I mean, it's, it's shorter fiber. So if you were to use something like Abaca or a longer fiber, it just takes you a longer time to remove it. So to blow it out. Spend, and how long yeah, are you beating that, that cotton? We beat it for an hour and 15 minutes. So she cooched it and there's the fine. This isn't the final piece, but this is another addition that we made with him. And because we're using Abaca, which is high shrinkage for the base sheet, and cotton, which... I so the fact that the Abaca, the Abaca sort of shrinks around, and you can see that with the wrinkle lines on there, that's the cotton in the middle, yeah. and the Abaca sort of makes those really awesome detail lines. There's a larger piece where we left a lot of the fiber with the pigment that had been blown off to create that kind of halo. Now, do you have artists who come in and they'll make the paper pieces and then they'll take those back to the studio and then they'll layer on top of it with other materials as well? Definitely, yeah. It's sometimes people think, oh, it's cheating if I do something else to it, but it's not at all. So we're, you know, obviously not opposed to printing on top or drawing, painting, collage, anything like that at all. It's just we mainly focus on making works out of pulp. So our new lab grant resident is Swoon, who is uh, probably known as a street artist. She uses a lot of wheat paste. Um, she just started with us and we knew that she wanted to do a really large piece using blowouts and collage material and stuff like that. So here we're using mylar again for a blowout. It's just much bigger. So there's a lot of little points and pieces and so it took a lot of us to do the blowout. Mm -hmm. It was a 40 by 60 inch mold, and then a lot of people to also lift that mylar off that base sheet. Yeah. <laughs> eye droppers. Um, so she brought a lot of these other mylar stencils that we ended up just pulling large sheets instead of smaller ones and doing the blowout on there that she could then use for collage elements. Mm. Here are the four base sheets that were put together to make one piece, and there's um, pulp painting and pouring, uh, the blowouts, so many different layers. And then here's the final piece. Oh, good Lord, that's wonderful. It's what wonderful. are those layers in the front with the woman and the figure and the other pieces? Are those all paper or did she? So she took mylar and painted on it to create that figure. It kind of looks like oh. a mylar, which she does a lot in her studio. She'll do this as well. Yeah. So for this piece, we're kind of doing both things. This she's only been in two days to make this piece. So oh wow, um, holy cow! So it'll be exciting to see what we continue doing when we have a little more time together. So yeah, and when you're open, when you're fully open, back fully up. Open, exactly. So we also can make seven by ten foot sheets of paper. Um, here's William Kentridge. He wanted uh, just plain white sheets to draw on, and it's made using a silk screen and pouring. We don't have oh. a prep or um, you know, a drying system to dry these, so it dries on the, on the silk screen. screen. Yep, and here we 
this is how we suck the water out. We don't have a vacuum table that large either. So right. this is a project with Doho Sa and we put down a piece of water soluble fabric that has embroidery on it. We laid that on top of that sheet and we're using a sponge to try to tap down the that gelatin. Yeah, to make it more flat. Exactly. And so there's, after we've removed the, the sheet and the water soluble fabric has dissolved into that base sheet and you're left with just the embroidery. Here's some smaller ones. So he creates all of these in Korea and then every few years he comes over and we make a number of these. They are pretty. There's a detail. Is he hand embroidering or machine embroidering? Your machine is a seven by 10 foot piece right here. It takes about eight to 10 people um, to, to make them. To make one. We always have to find someone that has really long arms that can <laughs> like pat down the middle. He's also working on a project with us where he brought in, this was from another sculpture, sculpture that he made, but they are uniforms that he wore in Korea from when he was mm -hmm. a child and to, through his, or till his 20s. And we're doing another laminate cast project with him using that high shrinkage Abaca fiber on top of these uniforms. Once it dries, then we remove them and they're all connected together. Um, oh. It's a pretty big project that's been going on for years, trying to really figure out the best way to make it work. This was a test piece. Just to figure out how to get it off has been tricky, but we're getting there. So yeah. we'll continue yeah. this project with him for a while. So this was actually the very first artist I worked with. Um, she's one of my favorite artists, and so I was, was a little intimidating, but <laughs> the first day I worked with her, I realized this was, it was going to be great. Um, Anne Hamilton was a lab grant resident starting in 2010, and we didn't really finish up until 2014 because it's a pretty big project. So she makes a lot of on-site installations. And when she came for her first few days, silk from India and like raw sheep's wool that we were embedding into Abaca. And wherever you have a sheet of paper and a piece of fabric and then another sheet of paper, it can create this pocket. It's not, you know, the two layers <laughs> aren't attaching. So she started to have me put my arm or my hands or my legs, and it creates this beautiful rattle when you move it around. Oh, wow. So we made a number of these, and she decided to um, create this paper instrument for performers to wear. Her wow. friend, David Lang, started, he, um, started Bang on a Can which is an experimental music organization, and they have a workshop each year <laughs> at Mass Mocha in one of their buildings that was like, nobody was in there, and we were rehearsing, and then we ended up performing with about 38 musicians that were there for the workshop, and it was kind of a call and response. There was a conductor, but at the beginning of the workshop, we would dress each of these performers in layers of um, these kind of paper oh. instruments. Oh so my gosh. Aprons and hand pieces. And we ended up having the performance in this kind of weird rehearsal space that they cleaned up for us. So it was very raw. And it was really amazing to hear that many people make that sound. That rattle of the abaca is very crisp. And so there's the conductor. And these are incredibly beautiful. Like you said, the space is really raw, but it respects the abaca, I guess. Is it is. That's, nice. That's a weird way to put it, but you no. know what I mean? They're sort of, it's honoring the paper itself. and the. Yeah. So this was like, this was a major project. I can't, I'm, maybe in the past, Dudenay, they've done some kind of a performance piece, but I don't know about it right now. So this yeah. was really fun to be a part of that. It was, a, And then we had like a little installation. Um, some of the pieces were on the wall at Mass Mocha for a while. And hopefully one day we'll be able to do something like this again. Um, So that was that's a good snippet. The of what sound. I love that sound. That's nice. Uh, this is Arlene Sheckett, who was a workspace resident a long time ago and was making these beautiful um, pulp painted pieces through stencils of mandalas and 
Um, she also did these beautiful kind of plaster pieces that she also did a laminate casting technique over. So it was a paper piece on top of the actual plaster piece that it was cast. Oh, wow. And is this indigo or paint or this, pigment? This is pigment through stencils. So wow. the sheet was pulled and pulp painted through a stencil. It was partially pressed and then wrapped around those forms. Let oh my goodness. And then removing it so that you just have the shell of the piece. Oh, those are just beautiful. She came back a couple years ago with, um, she's a ceramic artist. She makes very large sculptures in uh, mostly clay. So she brought in these molds that she uh, made off of some like clay pieces in her studio that she could reconfigure into different pieces. Also using layers of um, pulp paint through stencils or paint brushes and then a casting cotton when I'll show I'll show you this in a minute but would go on the back of each so that you could then still see all of the um oh I see that down yeah. there on the right kind bottom a little bit yeah there we go they look it's so hard to photograph stuff like this it really is you have to see it in person yeah. which right when now is hard to <laughs> This is just a shot from her show. So some of those pieces, the little clay sculpture has clay and paper as well. So this was a project with Mark Bradford and the Art for Justice Fund that Agnes Gunn started. Um, if you're not familiar with his work, he's a painter and he works with a lot of layers of paper on a large scale. So I don't think paper. Um, he's working with the object of a police body camera. So we had a real police body camera that we made a rubber mold out of. And you can see they're, they're putting pulp into, we had about four rubber molds. They're putting pulp into it right there. And it was yeah. really detailed. So we wanted to try to pick up as much of that detail as we could. And there's a terrible picture of me, but you can see the body camera is next to the paper piece right there. So they're super detailed, so you can't see, but I'm looking at the top of the camera where the toggle would be to turn it on and off. This has been pressed in the press and taken out and put on like a plexiglass just to kind of hold it down so it doesn't shrink when it dries. And I'm yeah. coming back with a wet, just water paintbrush with water to kind of tap down and just, um, I'm basically- Make it yeah, right. just making it even and, and yeah. per perfect. <laughs> this is um, jumping ahead, but this is how we press them. So once we have that pulp in the mold, it goes on a board and we cover it with um, a cloth and felt and then these really thick foam pieces that we can then press in the hydraulic press. So um, you can actually make a number of these in a day. So it doesn't okay. have to dry in the rubber mold. So we've pressed it. We don't press it all the way. It's just like partially press it, take it out, flip it over, and then you can remove the mold. This is obviously not the camera, but. Right. And it takes a few people to take the mold off usually. Usually that one was pretty thick and heavy. Um, with the camera, so that was an addition of 45. And I would say for when we were first making them, it, they're really difficult because they're so detailed that for every five, we would maybe have one that was okay. Yeah. But the better we got, you know, you could make, um, you could do it by yourself. You could just, you figured out how to do you it. You figured out. So how many of the cameras did they, did you end up with for um, this project? There was, it was an addition of 45 plus artist proofs plus Dudenay, I can't remember the exact amount. And I don't think I want to know how many extra cameras we had. <laughs> we had to Did shut you down. You just repulp the ones that messed up, quote, unquote, messed up? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, but he wanted it to look very plasticky, so we ended up putting layers of acrylic ink. Oh, okay. After brushing or using an eyedropper to create that plasticky effect, like it looked very plastic, and then painting the around the lens with red. So all of that was done after. And then letterpress printed with the serial number from the body cam. Yeah. 
Okay. And then that's a really big sheet of blue paper. <laughs> <laughs> so, exactly. So I just wanted to throw in, I'm always asked about my own work. It's interesting because of my job, I'm constantly working with artists to help them make their own work, which I actually really love. So it is really difficult to make my own work, I have to say, to be honest, yeah. um, because I do work in paper. So of course, I have all of these fabulous materials and equipment and everything. Um, but it is difficult to work, you know, five days a week, uh, over 40 hours and then come in again on the weekend or stay at night making my own work. It's hard. It's so, hard. I, Do you find it part of the difficulty because you're so supportive and collaborative with the other artists that you maybe um, don't have that energy left for yourself and for your own work? Is that part of it too? That's part of it. Yeah, it's hard. It's um, I, you know, it's very tiring work. It's not just the physical, but it's the concentration and level of just having to like be there when you're yeah. side by side with someone. Um, it's also just, once I'm there, if I go there on the weekend, I could stay, I mean, I really, I get into it, I'm fine. But it's just, yeah, it's been difficult. So over the years, I've tried to, and I don't have a separate studio. I work there. But over the years, I've tried to find ways to work <laughs> in paper, but not actually in the studio. It just depends on what project I have. Walk us through your studio, your, yeah, your so this, work. This is actually, because I don't have my own studio, whenever I have projects that I know I want to do, or like a bigger project or show, I either... Um, sublet a space or I will go on a residency. Yeah. So this is last year I was at Vermont Studio Center and I started to experiment with um, my collection of textiles. So I use a lot of textiles in my own work. I was weaving for a long time. So I'm just, I'm drawn to textiles. I love them in paper. I think I I don't know if you remember my thesis program at yes. Chicago, but yes, I was using textiles then as well. So this is my, yes. I feel like this is what the inside of my brain looks like sometimes. <laughs> this is what I think of. And I love having all of the material around me. So when I was there, they put me in this great, a great um, print shop. So I, I didn't know I was going to have a press as well. So I ended up using them kind of like a collagraph or something. I brought paper and I just brought, I can't tell you how many sheets of Abaca paper in all different kinds of consistencies. So thick Abaca, thin Abaca, that was my main, um, main um paper that I was using then. So this was just a piece of 40 by 60 inch paper that I started to fold and put into a grid. And these are all experimentations for me. They're kind oh. of graphic, which I typically don't really do. So it was fun. These are like scientific filters that have graphite and wax on top of them. So these are these are scientific filters with graphite and, and wax. And wax. Exactly. And you've just collaged them on top of the abaca. Exactly. As so, well. oh. yeah. so using the handmade paper. And then I started to take those textiles and mount them on wood and put abaca paper over them. So it would really create this skin wax on top of that. So I What kind of wax are you using? Are you just rubbing it on? Is it dipping? Are you using encaustic or beeswax? So sometimes encaustic or sometimes um, cold wax. I was using both and this was I was doing a lot of experimenting with I still am. So I'm just continuously making these now. I to have a installation or I have no idea so yeah so I made a number of these and they're kind of like I don't know I look at them as like reliquaries and they're hard to see in photographs but they have sort of a metallic feel to me they they kind of look like metal and they're all um collars they're all collars that you would wear so this is actually like a this is like a bib it is a bib even these so I began using the collar form and shape two years, three years ago, just because 
I had a lot of people send me those starched collars. These are like little things that you put under your collar that kind of cross. So again, just experimenting with these. Um, here are some of the starched collars that, this was again in the studio that I was playing around with. So now I'm building um, stands for these, inspired by Louise Bourgeois, if you can't tell. So, and then oh, this wow. is a project that I worked on when I had a residency at the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts. Um, again, using collars. These are not paper, they're all the actual collars um, from shirts that I cut off and covered in graphite and cold wax. And cut, I stiffened them beforehand and then wow. um, created an installation with them. And the shadows were so incredible. They looked almost like a flight of birds. Or yeah, and shadow is, shadow is part of, it's an art material that we need yeah. to take advantage of, light and shadow. So yeah, so that was kind of a few years ago was the last show I had. So, you know, I just kind of continually work on pieces and I'll be in little shows every now and then, but you know, I'm happy right now and I do what I can and I feel really mm -hmm. lucky to have a job, especially with everything going on and you know, at a small nonprofit and there aren't many jobs for paper makers. So I feel like, um, yeah, I feel like I hit the jackpot. It's like- You did hit the jackpot and you, I am so lucky that you came to this Corin tour to tell us all about it. I'm really, I mean, just looking at all of the artists that you've worked with and all of the things you get to do every day is just so wonderful. So thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you so much for joining us for today's Corin Tour with Amy Jacobs of Du Denae. It was such a pleasure to see the work that she's done with artists across the world and to look at her own work. If you want to support more of this programming, please visit artistbookhouse.org slash donate and send us a few dollars. We really appreciate it.